Turning now toward a discussion of Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophical masterpiece, The World is Will and Representation. Um, this book was published, this was his third book, and it was published in 1818, written by him in Dresden. Um, his second book had been On Vision and Colors, a, a treatise that he wrote uh, specifically for Goethe in 1816, and the first book was his dissertation on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, which he published at the age of 26 in 1813. So these three books constitute his, the, the first phase of his oeuvre and represent um, the early Schopenhauer. After he published The World as Will and Representation, Volume 1, in 1818, it was almost two full decades, not until 1836, that he started writing again. So disappointed was he by the lack of reception uh, for his book. And uh, in 1836, then he started back up again with the treatise called On the Will and Nature, which was followed by two essays on ethics and freedom. Then in 1844, by the second half, uh, the, all the supplements, volume two to the world as will and representation, and his final book was a collection of essays on, uh, a very large collection of essays called Paragra and Paralipomeno in 1851, which was basically uh, a popularization of his view. And by that time, people were starting to read him. Uh, they didn't start reading him until the last decade of his life in the 1850s. Um, as I've said in the previous discussion, he was a sort of forerunner of the materialism of the 19th century, and while he does use metaphysical ideas, the real essence and core of his teaching is both ethical and materialistic. Um, so it might be prudent to start by uh, looking back at his biography, since I, I think it's an interesting one for a philosopher. He was born in the city of Danzig in 1788 to a uh, wealthy merchant. His father, uh, Heinrich, was a wealthy businessman. Uh, who in, the, in his 40s had married a woman named Johanna, half his age. Um, she was interested in his money, but I don't think that she ever loved him. She wasn't particularly thrilled with him. And um, Schopenhauer was born in 1788. And then nine years later, his sister was born. Um, they lived for a while in Hamburg. And then when Schopenhauer came of age, his father uh, really wanted him to become a merchant, really wanted him to take over the business. And so he gave him a choice uh, when Schopenhauer was a teenager, when he was about uh, 16 or 17 years old, that he could either go uh, on a whirlwind tour through, uh, through Europe with his uh, parents, and at the end of that tour could come back, and then he would be required to take up apprenticeship in his father's uh, business, or he could forgo the tour and just go his own way and do whatever he wanted from that point. And Arthur uh, was torn at this point. He wasn't sure what he wanted to be. He didn't have any philosophical interests yet. Uh, but he did, he was definitely pulled in the direction of reading and fiction. Reading. He, he read lots of fiction and was very much interested in the humanities and probably already felt that he didn't really want to be a merchant despite his father's expectations. But he went on the tour anyway, gambling. And as it turned out, when they came back, his father died not too long after that in 1805. He had been going downhill for a while and he was confined to a wheelchair. He was basically an invalid while uh, Schopenhauer's mother, Johanna, became during this period a social butterfly and she was bouncing around from party to party and this became the basis of Schopenhauer's resentment of her and of women in general. He was a classic misogynist uh, that she went out partying while the father uh, was stuck uh, with his miserable illness uh, to a wheelchair and so eventually his father committed suicide by throwing himself off the top of his warehouse around 1805. That though was of course a blessing in disguise because it freed Schopenhauer now from the his father's expectations upon him to become a merchant, and so uh, he decided to begin reading and studying and to follow a career as a scholar. Again, he wasn't yet studying philosophy, he just knew he wanted to be some sort of a scholar. His mother now took the opportunity to move, to relocate, they were living in Hamburg at this time, to relocate to Weimar, where of course Goethe and Schiller lived, and his mother wanted to be at the center of the action. His mother was a literary individual, and when she moved to Weimar, she not only be became uh, a good friend of Goethe's and had him over and all the notables of Weimar over on a regular basis, but she also became a novelist in her own right, a kind of best-selling novelist of trashy pot boilers. Schopenhauer eventually came down to visit and he would hang out and uh, Goethe would show up at the soirees and ignore him. Uh, Schopenhauer did not have very good social skills and Goethe just sort of didn't even bother to pay any attention to him. Then at some point, uh, Schopenhauer decided to enter into the university, and he studied at the University of Göttingen, and he entered into that university with the intent of studying medicine. So he started off studying medicine, and about uh, halfway through his two-year sojourn there, 
he turned to philosophy and started reading Kant and then Plato. And then he decided he wanted to go to Berlin to hear Fichte lecture. So he traveled to Berlin, uh, went and watched Fichte give lectures, and he was completely disillusioned with Fichte at that point. He didn't like him at all. He uh, kept a notebook that has various sarcastic entries about the incomprehensibility of Fichte's positing of the ego and so forth. So uh, he wasn't too interested in Fichte. And he also read Schelling at, during this period at this time. So um, <clears throat> eventually he returned to Weimar, uh, stayed with his mother for a time. Things became very uncomfortable there. Uh, he had, of course, inherited uh, his father's uh, a, biz a portion of his father's business, so he didn't have to work. And so he decided to write his dissertation, and he went to live in the town of Rudolstadt, where he wrote his dissertation at the age of uh, 25, 26, um, in 1813, on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, which he then submitted to the University of Jena for a, uh, for a doctorate, and they awarded that doctorate to him based on, they basically rubber stamped it. They didn't uh, do much with it. His, they knew his mother. His mother was famous. And uh, as a favor to her, really, they just sort of processed it and rubber stamped it, and he was good to go. Then he paid to have it published in an edition of 500 copies, which sold only about 100 copies. But one of those copies went to Goethe, and Goethe was very impressed with this work. Uh, he liked it quite a bit, and he then invited Schopenhauer to come meet with him. And the two sat down and discussed Goethe's color theory and various philosophical discussions. And in response to Goethe's flattering interest in his work, Schopenhauer decided to write a work on vision and color in 1816. Uh, in 1810, Goethe had published his, what he regarded as his magnum opus, his theory of colors, which uh, disputed the Newtonian theory of colors. And Schopenhauer decided that he would better him, basically. Uh, for Goethe, color was something out there in the world. But for Schopenhauer, color became a function more of, the, more of the, both the mind, the intellect, and also the, the eyeball itself. And so he wrote this work and had the presumption to regard it as um, elevating Goethe's theory as though it were in need of elevation to the apex of a pyramid of thought of which Goethe's work was merely the base. Uh, Goethe might have taken some offense at this, but of course he was a, a social man, had great social skills, and knew how to deal with young upstarts like Schopenhauer. Uh, which he basically dealt with him by ignoring him for the most part and sending him polite letters and saying, well, thanks, I'll, this is interesting, I'll look at it. But he never really bothered much with it. But then uh, Schopenhauer decided to uh, write his philosophical masterwork, The World as Will and Representation, which he then wrote in Dresden. He moved to Dresden and from 1814 until 1818. Uh, in that town, he wrote the work and then had it published uh, and immediately offended his publisher by being impatient about uh, seeing the galleys and then accusing, uh, before the galleys were sent, he sent insults to the publisher, accusing him of not paying the honoraria to other authors on time. Uh, and he basically, Schopenhauer had no social skills whatsoever. He was basically kind of had the personality of a spoiled child. He was very arrogant, pompous, uh, and very short with people. And so he, at this time, while waiting for the appearance of the first edition, of the world as will and representation, he went on an, an, on an Italian journey. And during that Italian journey, he got a woman pregnant who uh, and fathered a daughter on her. Um, and the daughter died a few months later, which saved him, I guess, from having to become a father. Then he returned. And when he returned, uh, he found that Goethe had read uh, the world as will and representation. His sister sent him a letter reporting that Goethe was reading it eagerly and was enjoying it very much. So apparently Goethe liked it. But nobody else really did. The book didn't sell any better than the dissertation did, and it was largely ignored. And so Schopenhauer, at a certain point, um, <clears throat> there came a point where uh, the businessman who was in charge of his father's business was going bankrupt, and it looked like Schopenhauer could uh, lose his inheritance. He managed through a sort of shrewd transactions not to lose his inheritance, but the very fact that he might lose it uh, put his mind toward uh, coming up with a practical op occupation, so he started casting about looking for a professorship somewhere. And eventually, he was able to land one at the University of Berlin, where Hegel significantly had just been invited. Hegel, in 1817, had moved from Heidelberg to Berlin and was now teaching there. And so Schopenhauer went to the University of Berlin, which was a brand new university. At this time, it was only a few years old. And Berlin was pulling in all these great philosophers from all over Germany. Jena was no longer the great philosophical scene that it had been at the turn of the century, around 1800, when 
Fichte and Schelling and Halderlin and all these people had been there. Uh, then Schopenhauer went and he deliberately scheduled at the University of Berlin, deliberately scheduled his course uh, in which he would introduce to the world his book, The World as Will and Representation, at exactly the same hour that Hegel was accustomed to lecturing across the hall to huge packed auditoriums of about 200 students. And only, I think, about five people registered for Schopenhauer's course, and he basically ended up lecturing to an empty room. That only lasted for about a semester, and I guess his ego couldn't take uh, any more of that, and so he left. And part of the problem was that, as Rudiger Safransky remarks in his excellent biography on Schopenhauer and the Wild Years of Philosophy, part of the problem was that by this point, Schopenhauer's philosophy seemed like something of an anachronism. It seemed, for one thing, Kant had fallen, it was largely dependent upon, to a certain degree, Kant's philosophy, and Kant was regarded as passé already by this point. And also his elevation of art as a kind of religion unto itself was also passé, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, art began to be something that was seen as frivolous. It was mere entertainment. No longer was it taken seriously the way that it had been during the Napoleonic Wars. And so Schopenhauer's philosophy was seen as, as a kind of atavism, a, a holdover from another age that, uh, meanwhile, we had all moved on past. But, of course, that was not the case. It was actually the forerunner, not an atavism from another age, but the forerunner of the coming of the materialistic worldview of the 19th century. So he actually wasn't behind the times, he was ahead of it. So he spent uh, the next several decades uh, casting about listlessly. He had a, a girlfriend, um, a, he met a chorus woman, uh, a chorus girl in Berlin and had a five-year affair with her off and on as his girlfriend and eventually he moved and cast about, didn't write anything much uh, until 1836 when he started writing again. Uh, with the essay, the long essay on the will and nature. And then eventually, of course, time caught up with him and the public caught up with him and be began to read his works in the last year of his life in the 1850s, which, which he became something of a celebrity. Um, <clears throat> so that, in a nutshell, is the biographical sketch of his life. And now what I want to do is move directly into a discussion of the world as will and representation. Um, if we look at it, if we open it to, and I'm reading here, I'll be reading the, uh, the most common translation, the EFJ Payne translation. It, too, is broken up into a series of four books. And so uh, just as we looked at last time uh, in the previous audio file, how the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason was broken up into a mandala with four different functions in which uh, the, the gist of that essay was that the principle of sufficient reason is basically rooted in the intellect, and it is that principle by means of which, for anything that is the case, there must be a necessary reason for it. And there are four classes of objects, and therefore four subdivisions, four, four ways in which the principle divides itself, uh, each specializing for one of these four classes of objects, and for the class that has to do with physical objects spread out in time and space, these are handled by the principle of the sufficient reason of becoming, uh, which is the law of causality in which Schopenhauer had argued that the understanding is primarily perceptual, not intellectual, um, and that it comes equipped with an a priori ability to sort the world out causally and automatically and does not require reflection. It does it automatically. For example, he gave, he gave the example that uh, the retina sees the world upside down, but the brain automatically corrects it using the causal principle that is innate to it and sets it right. Um, and it also sees, of course, two images. We have two eyes, and each sees a complete image of the world, which the brain automatically has to synthesize together using the causality principle and so forth. So that is the principle of the sufficient reason of becoming, which has to do with how the mind makes sense out of the world of matter, space, time, and causality, and how they hang together in accordance with the hinge between space and time is basically causality. Then this is opposed to the principle of being, the principle of the sufficient reason of being, which has to do with mathematics, and the representations that, per, that uh, apply to the first class, uh, the principle of the sufficient reason of becoming, are intuitive representations. That is to say, they're concrete re representations in which the faculty of sensibility is wed together with the understanding, and the understanding takes the sensations from the outer world and it translates them into objective perceptions by applying intellect to it, uh, with respect to the principle of the sufficient reason of being, uh, the class of representations there are um, representations, they're, they're intuitive representations also, but they're pure representations because they don't have matter.